right. Well, good evening. Welcome to the Wednesday evening service. Look forward to a great night tonight. Well, it's a joy to be here tonight. Continue to pray for our pastor while he's away. Uh, I'm trying to convert over to the electric way, you know, following the footsteps of my pastor. <laughs> so if I go from point A to point H or something, uh, it's because I got lost. <laughs> but I am thankful that I get to preach to you. I get to, you know, preach at a lot of different churches while I'm on deputation. And uh, my wife and I, we always pray that we will be a blessing to the church that we're at, and we happen to be here tonight, so I want to be a blessing to you. I want to be uh, ask the Lord to help you in your Christian life, and uh, thank you for your prayers as we have been preparing for Uganda. Um, I, I was able to get my yellow fever shot a few weeks ago and uh, got things turned in for the visa and got that approved earlier in the week. And then my travel partner, he was able to get his yellow fever shot today. And that was a big hurdle uh, because he had some additional obstacles that he had to uh, overcome in order to get permission to do that. So thank you for your prayers. That will be coming up really soon. So uh, those, those guys over there in Uganda, they're, they're really excited. I got people giving me emails that I don't even know, saying I can hardly wait to see you and all this and that. So uh, pray that the Lord will use us in an incredible way. One of the things we're looking forward to is the fact that he's getting permission for us to go into the public schools and preach in there. So those opportunities and that potential there is, is, uh, uh, can only be determined by God for sure. So let's turn in our Bibles to first. Samuel chapter 17, 1 Samuel chapter 17, most of you know this story, the story of David and Goliath, but we're going to uh, present it tonight in a totally different manner. First Samuel chapter 17, and let's go ahead and stand, stretch just one more time here while we read the Word of God, and... Uh, then we'll settle in for some preaching. 1 Samuel chapter 17, we'll begin reading with verse 3. Uh, we'll read 3 through 7. And the Philistines stood on a mountain on the one side, and Israel stood on a mountain on the other side, and there was a valley between them. And there went out a champion out of the camp of the Philistines named Goliath of Gath, whose height was six cubits and a span. And he had a helmet of brass upon his head, and he was armed with a coat of mail, and the weight of the coat was 5,000 shekels of brass. And he had greaves of brass upon his legs and a target of brass between his shoulders. And the staff of his spear was like a weaver's beam, and his spear's head weighed 600 shekels of iron, and one bearing a shield went before him. Now let's look at verse 50. So David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and with a stone and smote the Philistine and slew him. And there was no sword in the hand of David. Therefore David ran and stood upon the Philistine and took his sword and drew it out of the sheath thereof and slew him and cut off his head therewith. And when the Philistines saw their champion was dead, they fled. Now let's pray. Our kind and gracious Heavenly Father, we do thank you for your goodness to us, allowing us to be in church tonight. Uh, we could be anywhere and in a miserable state, and you allow us to sit here and hear from the Word of God. I pray, Holy Spirit, that you'd work through your Word to speak to their hearts, Help them in their Christian lives. I pray if there's anyone here tonight that is not sure of their salvation, that they'd be sure before it's eternally too late. We commit ourselves to Thee. We thank You for allowing us to preach the Word of God. I love You very much. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. You may be seated. 
Goliath was a champion warrior. Do not, I repeat, do not underestimate the fact that Goliath was a champion. He must be given that respect for the message tonight or it will have very little meaning. There is something to me that's always been fascinating with war heroes or great heroes. Sometimes those guys are super smart or sly or crafty or have uh, minds that seem like they're stronger than steel and things that they're able to do. Sometimes uh, these warriors are uh, able to do am amazing feats of strength like Samson and David and their mighty men in their own right. But for Goliath, his most notable thing, his, most, his number one attribute was obviously his size. Now, my family years ago, we went to York, Pennsylvania uh, to the Weightlifting Hall of Fame and it was a museum for famous strong men. And in the early days, the strong guys were mostly in circuses and carnivals and wrestlers. And there was one guy, his, they had his head sculpted there by the name of Maurice Tillett. And his head was literally, it was that big, it was monstrosous. Through the years I've seen some fantastic photos of big people. How many of you have heard of Andre the Giant? He's, he's passed away now. But, uh, you know, one time I saw him in a, uh, I didn't see him personally, but I saw it in a picture where he was wrestling with Hulk Hogan, who's a very big guy, Hulk, Hulk Hogan's 6'8", and he had his hands wrapped around his neck, and his, his fingers were touching each other. So you can imagine how big he was. Andre the Giant, he was 7'4", and he weighed uh, 520 pounds. Now the Bible tells us here the specifications for Goliath. So how tall was he? The Bible says he was six cubits and a span tall. We get that from verse 4. And there went out a champion out of the camp of the Philistines named Goliath of Gath, whose height was six cubits and a span. Well, uh, how, how big is that? Well, there's four types of cubits. First, there's the Babylonian cubit, which is 19.8 inches long. Then there's the Egyptian cubit, which is 20.65 inches long. Then there's the standard Hebrew cubit, which is 20.4 inches long. And then last we have what is called the common cubit, which is 17.5 inches long. So which one was it? Well, I don't know for sure, but since we're reading uh, uh, Jewish history from a book that was given to the Jews, amen, uh, in 1 Samuel, I would imagine it's the Jewish cubit, which was 20.4 inches. When you add a span, which is the distance from here, that's a span, it would make Goliath over... 11 feet tall. He would weigh about 700 pounds. Now, I know if you look at some authors today, they have him whittled all the way down to about 8 feet, but that certainly is not the way that it is. The tallest man living today, uh, I think he's retired, but he, at the time I did these notes, he was a Virginia sheriff by the name of George Bell, and he was uh, 8 foot 4 inches tall. Now, again, when we're, when we're talking about this story, Saul was head and shoulders above everybody. And certainly there had to be a common man that was, say, six foot five. So Saul was way up there, and Saul didn't even want to attempt to uh, tangle with Goliath. So Goliath was absolutely huge. Today, we're not going to... Uh, talk specifically about salvation. This is not what we would call a salvation message. I want to talk to you about your Christian life. Uh, particularly if you've had any time at all in your Christian life, this message is going to be very important to you. 
Before we get into the actual points of the message, tonight's message is not just going to be for you older Christians or some of you that have been on the way for a while, but uh, it's a personal inspection. Now, I'm not, I'm not the inspector. It's the Holy Spirit that's the inspector. So what I would ask is I would ask that you would be honest in your inspection. Now, there's, there's some people that they have not been to the altar for over a year. Now, I, 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 I'm not the Holy Spirit, but you're not that good. You say, well, Brother Yoder, I have um, uh, physical problems and I can't get down. Well, I'm, I'm not talking to you then. I'm talking to the people that sit in their seat week after week that the Holy Spirit is knocking on their heart and they're wondering, why is He doing that to me? You see, the Holy Spirit, He points out things in our life because He loves you. And He wants you to be more like the Savior. So, before we get started, tell yourself, again, I am not the inspector, but tell yourself that you're going to be honest with the Lord tonight. I will not be preaching from a doctrinal basis. What I will be doing is I'll be preaching from a practical standpoint. So the things that I'm going to give you tonight in these various points uh, are something that you can apply immediately to your life. In this story, historically, David and Israel are the heroes. However, I do not want to approach the message from that way. Again, David, uh, under the power of God, had complete victory. But the Bible tells us in the New Testament that the Old Testament was written for our examples and says our and samples and different things like that to let us know in other places he uses the word allegory. So he's showing you a picture of different things throughout all time because this is not just a book for uh, Old Testament Jews. This is a book for today. This is a book for 2018 and he wants to help you in your Christian life right now. So what we're going to do is we're going to take a look at this. And how, how many of you have ever played um, organized sports before? I don't mean you just went in the backyard and your buddies, but you actually were on a team and so forth. Okay, you can put your hands down. Now, when I was in, in junior high and I was playing organized football for the first time, we would watch football films. We'd play the game and then they would show us the film of the game. And, you know, you'd be going in slow motion. And, and you know, in my day, uh, some of you guys aren't even going to understand this, but in my day, it was, it was real to real. You know, they had real to real, okay? And, and so they'd go a couple frames and they'd back it up. They'd go a couple frames and they'd back it up. And they'd, and they'd drive you nuts! But uh, that's what they do to show you what's happening on the football field. And the coach would get mad and blow his temper and say, How could you let this happen? Well, this is what we're going to do with Goliath tonight. Again, I, I said it was David and the power of God that allowed him to get victory, but we're going to look at some things that he had absolutely set himself up for complete failure. Number one, first of all, he ignored the fact that he was an easy target. Let's look at verse 6. And he had greaves of brass between, upon his legs and a target of brass between his shoulders. Now, again, when this Bible was written by God, the author, yes, men wrote it down with pencil and paper or whatever they used, we know that, but God was the author. Of course, Brother Bowman understands that because he's got a printing ministry and he knows how that works. And that's what God did. These are, these are God's words. And God chose the word target for a reason. He didn't, he didn't say covering up here or anything like that. He used the word target. Now, the biggest person on the battlefield was Goliath. And so, he was the easiest target. 
want you to, if you have a marker or something, put that. Chapter 2, or make that Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6, and let's look at verse 18. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. Well, Dr. Yoder, you know, I'm just doing the best I can and the Lord will just have to understand. Well, I want to tell you, the Bible says that you have people watching you and you have people that are praying for you. Don't get to where you're like Cain and say, well, am I my brother's keeper? And the answer is, yes, you are. Yes, you are. Those of you that have positions of authority in the church from being a Sunday school teacher on up, uh, be careful because the devil wants to ruin your life. And the reason is, is because you have a bigger target on your chest than anybody else. You know, most of the people that say, Oh, pastor, pray for me. The devil's been on my back all day. Most people are like that. They're, they're consumed with their self. And it's not the devil that's on their back. It's just they're consumed with their own self. God's, God has this thing set up, but the devil knows uh, who is important. Brother Yoder, are you saying I'm unimportant? I didn't say that. I, what I said is, those of you that are doing something for the Lord, those are the people that the devil wants to ruin. You see, because people that are living for themselves, they're going to ruin themselves. The devil doesn't have to interfere. He just lets things run. Because those are the kind of people that are filling themselves with TV, they're filling themselves with bad music, they can't find time to read their Bible, they find time to gossip, and all these other things, the devil don't need to worry about them. So we must determine in our mind that we want to do something for Jesus Christ, but we must remember that when we make that determination that we are making our target bigger. And those of you that are doing something for the cause of Christ, you're bigger than the average Joe, and I'm not saying that to give you pride, I'm saying that because you need to uh, remember that that is the fact. And Goliath was the biggest person out there and he had the biggest thing on his chest and he didn't even remember that. Many of us that have been on this way for a while serving the Lord, we're, go we're going to have the marks of, of a warrior. The Bible says a just man falleth seven times and riseth up again. Hey, no nobody gets through this thing unscathed. But we also make some mistakes. But there's, there's a difference between being wounded and going on and those that get shot right here. If you're an elderly man, you need to show people Christ. We, we get this idea because that we, we get older and we physically slow down that, well, we can't do anything anymore. Yes, you can. Encourage the young people. Goliath forgot that every eye in the whole camp was on him. Elderly people in here, the kids in this room, and the younger people, they know that you have experience. They know that you have knowledge. They know that you have wisdom. So show them Christ! Now, ladies, I'm glad you're here. I'm not picking on you. If you weren't here, this place would stink. <laughs> but the Bible tells us in Titus chapter 2 that the ladies are supposed to be holy. Now, 
The Lord has given you great influence. And again, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not your inspector, but I'm just asking you, how much have you helped the teenage girls in here? We as men, as ladies, we need to pray, God, do something with my life while I still have breath. Use me, God, help me to be a great influence on the young people whom I'm working with. Do you have a Sunday school class? Do you have people that are attracted to you for any particular reason? Ask God to help you. Paul said that he wanted to be an open target for all to see. But he said, maximize my influence and output for Christ. If you want to do anything at all for the Lord, get over the fact that you're hurting because that's the way it is in battle. And you are a big target. Go back to 1 Samuel, please, chapter 17. Let's look at verse 33. 1 Samuel 17, 33. And Saul said to David, Thou art not able to go against uh, this Philistine to fight with him, for thou art but a youth, and he a man of war from his youth. Let's look at verse 9. Go back to verse 9. If he be able to fight with me and to kill me, then will we be your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then shall ye be our servants and serve us. Number two, he saw himself as a giant in what he had done, not in what he was getting ready to do. In other words, uh, nobody's ever been able to stay with me so your challenger probably will not be able to stay with me either. You see, he was Goliath was living on his past accomplishments. The Bible talks in Ecclesiastes chapter 11, verse 6. You can look at it later. He talks about evening sowing. And the story is about Solomon. You see, Solomon wrote the Proverbs when he was younger, but when he was an old man, that's when he wrote the book of Ecclesiastes. And he realized that he blew it in life. The older he became, the more miserable he became because as he aged, he did, not, he did not do what he was taught when he was a youngster. Maybe you've done some important things for the Lord. Maybe you've won a bunch of people to the Lord Jesus Christ. Maybe you're a faithful deacon. Maybe you're having a big impact on the ladies of the church. Uh, but we, we have to get this to continue on. There's too many people that have the wisdom, that have the knowledge, that know the Bible, and then they crawl in their hole. Where, where's, the, uh, where's the ladies' prayer group in, in our church? When I, when I was a young man, uh, I'd go to prayer meeting, and there was an old man. He he won he won every year. We had an award for the oldest father, <laughs> and he won every year. And 93 year old Harold Trumbull would come up to me and he'd say, "Are you going soul winning this week? We'll see you there. Are you going to prayer meeting? We'll see you there." And he'd take out his Bible and it's a piece of paper and it'd be all covered with different things. And he said, "This is what I got out of my Bible study this week. Would you get?" Yes, we need to think of the future as far as the work of God is concerned. But we, as individuals, were closer to heaven than we used to be. So we cannot uh, uh, let our mind continually drift to the past. And yes, many of you are giants for the Lord. But you must always see yourself as capturing victory for the Lord now and in days to come. When the Lord calls you home, then your service is done. Paul said in Philippians chapter 3, verse 14, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. When did he say this? He wrote this at the end of his life. Now 
Mrs. Parrish, I wouldn't hurt you for the war, for the for anything. Here she is, older than some. Did I say that right? And, and she's going to uh, Grove City School of the Bible to learn more. What a great example. What a great example. And, and there's others, too. She just comes to mind because at times she doesn't have the best health. Man, we got to say until the Lord calls us home, I'm heaven bound with the pedal down. Amen? Number three, Goliath began to decline morally. We know from the Bible that Goliath was a very immoral man. And I'm not insinuating that you are in any way. So don't say, well, Brother Yoder said I was, well, no, I'm not saying that. I'm saying that's what he was. Let's look at verses 8 through 10 of chapter 17. And he stood and he cried unto the armies of Israel and said unto them, Why are ye come out to set your battle in array? Am not I a Philistine and ye servants to Saul? Choose a man for you and let him come down to me. If he be able to fight with me and to kill me, then will we be your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then shall ye be our servants and serve us. And the Philistine said, I defy the armies of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. Now what's, what's wrong with what he said there? Other than the fact that he's on the wrong side, not really anything. He just made a challenge to what we would say the other team. But let's look at verse 43. And the Philistines said unto David, that's Goliath, Am I a dog, that thou comest to me with staves? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. And the Philistine said to David, Come to me, and I will give thy flesh unto the fowls of the air and to the beasts of the field. So he has gone from a standard challenge, now he's gone to mockery, profanity, exaggeration, and some of those words in there, if you knew exactly what they meant, we couldn't even discuss them in a mixed crowd. Again, just between you and God, are you allowing things in your life now because you are older? You say, well, I am older and it doesn't bother me now. Wait a minute, I, I thought you were a Christian. We're supposed to be living in the Spirit. Are you trying to say that sin no longer bothers you? Or are we going to be like Hollywood and, and put ratings on things that we do and then when we get old enough in our spiritual life, it's okay? How many of you in here think it's wrong to drink? Well, that's good. Amen. You can put your hands down. Well, then it's wrong to drink if you're underage. It's wrong to drink if you're over 18. It's wrong to drink if you're over 21. It's wrong all the time. Amen? But yet, in our moral life, we allow other things in that should not be. I want to tell you, hey, uh, what we're talking about here is somebody that was a champion. But he began to decline morally. I believe I'm talking to some champions for the faith here tonight. You've done some things for God and you want to do more, but be careful that you don't have a, uh, the, that you forget that you have a big target on you because you want to do something for the Lord, because you've done something for the Lord. And don't live in the past, but be careful as our society declines morally, you don't decline with it. The disciples, their biggest problem that they had was they were always thinking physical when Jesus was talking spiritual. We're supposed to be walking with the Lord all day long. It grieves the Holy Spirit in a terrible way, which is another sin in itself. 
But in Romans chapter 13, verse 14, the Bible says, But put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ, and make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lusts thereof. When you get filled with Christ, there's no room in the flesh. You're supposed to put yourself in a position, listen to me now, you're supposed to put yourself in a position to where if you're going to sin, you would have to do it on purpose. And then don't do it. But we just go, uh, you know, through life like this sometimes. Oh God, please protect me today. No, oh, open your eyes up and look in the mirror and see what's happening to you. Do you remember the story of Joab and David and how Uriah got killed? David said to put Uriah in the front of the battle so that he would easily get killed because that was his plan. He, that's why the Bible holds that sin against him. And Joab responded, You knew, David, that Abimelech uh, got hit on the head with a piece of millstone by a woman. Why would you put Uriah even closer than that to where he could get hit with uh, an arrow? You say, Brother Yoda, you're not making much sense. Okay, here's the thing. We know these things are happening all around us. And we have got to wake up. Parents, you have got to wake up what's happening in your families. Today I'm talking about death of a champion. We're getting ready for our 63rd anniversary. And one of the, the main, what we'll call him, pillars of the church uh, was a man by the name of Ken Richardson. How many of you know him or knew him? Okay. He was um, Steve Richardson's dad. And he would come up to me, and Brother Richardson, he had, he had poor health in his older years, and uh, he had a lot of heart and stomach surgeries. And he would say, Brother Yoder, he would say, my greatest fear is that under the anesthetic, I would say something that would shame the cause of Christ. Out of all the things that could be said, he said, that is what I fear the most. The Lord answered his prayer. He never, he never did shame his Savior. But you see, we're working out in the world. We're constantly putting that junk in there. In through here, in through here, and in other ways. And we're, we're filled up with it, and we have got to constantly be aware of our condition. Let's move on here quickly. Number four, he lost his shield bearer. Look at verse seven. And the staff of his spear was like a weaver's beam, and his spear's head weighed 600 shekels of iron, and one bearing a shield went before him. Verse 48. And it came to pass when the Philistine arose and came and drew nigh to meet David, that David hasted and ran toward the army to meet the Philistine. And you don't read anything in there about his armor bearer. You see, at that time, the, 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 the shield bearer, excuse me, the shield bearer, it was not just a, a little thing like this, you know. Da, 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 da. No, it was a big giant thing that went almost, uh, uh, almost like a semicircle. And they could crouch down behind it. And he was so big that he had this shield bearer just for him that went before him. But apparently, he was relieved of his position. Because we see no effort at all, or him even mentioned from that point on, back in uh, verse 7. So what is our sh shield bearer? Our protection is what we call accountability. Some of you have lost your shield bearer. The thing that's going to save your neck, 
you refuse to allow anybody to help you. Let me give you an example. <clears throat> I, could, I could tell anybody in here how to lose weight. You say, man, I've tried everything. I really want to lose weight. Okay, I can tell you how. Okay? Here, here, here's how you do it. You select three adults, any three, and two junior high kids, any two junior high kids, and you tell them, I want to lose weight, and I need your help. Will you help me? Then you write down every single thing that you eat or drink, including the amount, everything. And then you give a copy of that to those kids every week. And you'll see the pounds come right off. Because you know that every one of those little kids is going to blab what you ate. <laughs> It'll work. And that's called accountability. But, and I use that as a joke. But listen, hey, we, we have got to be that way in our Christian life. People ought to know what you're doing. We, we are not members of the Secret Service. We, we want to have some influence for the cause of Christ. Where, where do you disappear to on Sunday night? Now again, I, I know I'm kind of preaching to the choir. Amen, Brother Reed? Because you're here. Alright? It's a Wednesday night. You're here. You love the Lord. But l listen, don't Throw accountability out of your life. Use it to advance your life. In the military, you always had to check in. Amen, Brother Paul Abel? As soon as you were done with your job, check in. What did that mean? That meant you know, they were going to give you more work. But you see, the Bible tells us in this war, there's no discharge. Therefore, like Goliath, you had better start checking in or pretty soon you'll be checking out. You see, the Bible tells us that the Christian life, we are to be using the shield of faith. As a Christian gains maturity and experience, we think we plan for God until uh, it's, it's so organized we don't have any room for faith. We count on Him for nothing. I was talking to some people last week, and I told him, I said, what most Christians are guilty of is what we would call plan B. In other words, if God doesn't work the way that I think He should work, then I'm going to forget that, and I'm going to do plan B so that I'm not the one that's hurting. We can trust God. He can fully be trusted. But be careful, Goliath, because disaster may be closer than what you think because you're not willing to present your uh, spiritual life before anybody. Quickly, let's look at verse 48. And it came to pass when the Philistine arose and came and drew nigh to meet David that David hasted and ran toward the army to meet the Philistine. The Bible says here, the Philistine arose. Well, we would all say that that's a pretty bad idea for a foot soldier to be sitting down in battle. It's not the scenario, man, he's so worn out that he needs to get, sit down and get some rest. That wasn't it at all. Goliath is willfully sitting down while there is a battle where you have literally two nations. Uh, the decision is in his hands. And there he sits on his gargantuan pockets. I'm afraid that sometimes we have champions sitting down when they should be leading the battle. Not all people, but most people will have to fight laziness. When David got into trouble later in his life, he got into trouble because he was taking a break. It was the time when kings were supposed to be at war. 
The disciples of Jesus Christ were at times sleeping on the job. In Psalms 119, verse 60, the Bible tells us to make haste. He told Zacchaeus in Luke chapter 19, verses 5 and 6, make haste. And Zacchaeus made haste. He told Paul to make haste in Acts 22, 18. Sometimes we say that we are so busy that we can't do certain things for the Lord. And I understand at times you have to. There's, there's no way around it. But there's some that they just need to quit being lazy for the Lord. I've been at this church for three years now, and we basically still have the same three or four people that come to soul winning on Saturdays. Now again, I, I keep qualifying this because I'm not, trying, I'm not trying to be heartless. The older you are, the more effort it takes. But the Bible tells you that if he will in no wise, if he's not going to forget about a cup of cold water given in a disciple's name, he's keeping the record. You're not going to lose out. I'll tell you, one of the hardest things to do is to pray. It is so hard to pray because when you're praying, the devil puts in your mind, what are you doing? Who are you talking to? Isn't that what crazy people do? Talk to themselves? And, they, and, and all different thoughts like that, and it's hard. But the Bible tells us that we are supposed to fervently pray and contend for the faith. And Jesus sweat great drops of blood while He was praying. It's work. It's very difficult. But we must do it. Verse 49. And David put his hand in his bag and took thence a stone and slang it and smote the Philistine in his forehead that the stone sunk into his forehead and he fell upon his face to the earth. Now, I've, I've looked at some different helmets of war, different soldiers' uh, uh, armor and, and variety of different things or whatever. And there was only one, Brother Woods, that I saw to where the forehead wasn't covered. You know, he didn't have his helmet cocked on like a baseball hat sitting way back here, and then David hit him in the head like that. In, in like I said, every helmet that I've looked at, um, they're, they're very much like a football helmet. They come down here, they go around here. Some of them even have a thing right here. The fact is, he wasn't wearing his helmet. <laughs> he, he said, yeah, send me a man to fight! And here comes David, young kid. <laughs> he, he said, man, you've got to be kidding me. Uh, our armor bearer, just, just go, go back to the rest of the garrison. We, we're not going to need you. you got to be kidding me. This is crazy. And he sits down like this, and... David gets closer and closer, and the Bible says that David made haste, and he was running and getting close, and next thing you know, he gets up like that. Bam! He gets hit right in the head. I'll take care of it, okay? Goliath was overconfident. Christian that has been on the way for a while, you better listen to me. Yes, you know the ropes of the Christian life. And that confidence is to be placed in the Lord. Yes, you have experience. But your confidence is not in you. It's to be in Him. You need to pray like it all depends on God. You need to beg God for the things uh, that the preacher has asked you to do that you will do them according to His honor and His glory. We have too many people serving men, and, and we need to have some people that are serving God. 
Let me get to the last one. Let's look at verse 51. Therefore David ran and stood up upon the Philistine and took his sword and drew it out of the sheath thereof and slew him and cut off his head therewith. And when the Philistines saw their champion was dead, they fled. Now let me ask you. I said at the beginning, we know that uh, David won because of the power of God on his life. But we also said we were going to look at these things that uh, Goliath had set himself up for complete failure. Here he was. He got rid of his, arm, his shield bearer. He's sitting down. He has his helmet off. Now the most incredible thing of all, David goes up to him and his sword is still in the sheath. Why in the world would you go into hand-to-hand combat bat with your sword still in the sheath? So in every way, Goliath was prepared for defeat. Yes, you are a champion, but your testimony and your works that you have done are not going to overcome the enemy. You must be prepared now for the enemy. Read God's Word. Christian, read and use your Bible. Christian, read and use your Bible. Christian, read and use your Bible. The Bible tells us in Jeremiah chapter 48, verse 10, that your sword is supposed to have some blood on it. We have too many Christians that have their sword still in the sheath. This book has blood on it. It has the blood of Jesus Christ Himself. It has the blood of the martyrs. It's time, Christian, it's time, Christian champion, that we start putting more blood, sweat, and tears behind this book and behind our prayers. In case you haven't noticed, the fronts are changing all the time. First, the enemy in America over the last 50 years was prosperity. Then it was complacency. And now, it's a literal physical takeover. As a nation, the only hope that we have is to learn from our Bibles, to use our Bibles, and tell people how to be saved from the Bible. Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. Americanizing foreign groups will not happen. They must be saved. They will never hold to our values, especially without our God. We need our champions, and we need those that have a firm foundation in the Word of God now more than ever. It's time to throw our lousy excuses away. You should be sharpening your sword, not packing it up. Get into the battle. Get into spiritual shape tonight we're talking about death of a champion we we don't want to lose you I'm not preaching church attendance tonight I don't want you to be lost in your spiritual life you say brother Yoder I've fallen down well then get up I'll give you this illustration and I'll be finished when I was in basic training, I was in first, uh, first platoon, and the drill sergeant said, we're having an inspection coming up. And he said, everything better be right. And, the, uh, excuse me, I was, in, I was in A company. I was in A company. Second company had a different drill sergeant. And he told his people the same thing. We better win this inspection. There better not be one thing out of place or you guys are going to get it. Well, the morning of the inspection, they sent us to the chow hall in the morning. And when we came back, they were going to tell us the results. But our our company, A company, was just fine. But that guy that said he's going to make his people pay, we were standing there and all of a sudden, 
all this stuff started coming out of the third story windows. I mean, he was just heave hoeing everything. Mattresses, pillows, bunk, uh, everything. Drill Sergeant Phillips threw it all out. Hey, I want to ask you tonight, in your spiritual life, what, what are you satisfied with? Has the Holy Spirit talked to you at all? Now, I know I've yelled and said a couple different things, but I mean, has the Holy Spirit put his finger on your heart and said, hey, he's talking about you? Are are you going to throw it out so that you can be a champion? Are you just going to keep on going through life? Let's pray. Our kind and gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for being so kind to us and letting us hear the good news of Jesus Christ and how to be saved. What a wonderful thing.